Hughes, James. <laughs> what questions do you have? What jumped out at you? What was interesting? Let's just start there. What's interesting about those readings you heard today? I'm hoping something. How many of you heard the readings today? <laughs> I'm going to get this so they can follow along. Okay, go grab some bulletins. All right, I'm going to read to you, James. So just let it fall on your ears. We'll start with James. We're going to bring you some programs so you can follow along. All righty, so here's a reading from James with a slightly different translation than what you heard. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For any of, if any are hearers of the word and, do, and are not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think that they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. There's a lot in that passage. So what were some just phrases and words that jumped out at you and James? Just, just throw out some, what just, what just sat with you? I just read it out loud. What, something that just drew you in. You just kind of stopped listening at this word. It always happens to us. Go ahead, Jim. Almost all other oriented and not something. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. What else? What else? Anybody else? Carol? Oh, go ahead. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers of the Be doers. Yes. Be doers. What else? Anybody else? Love to speak. Slow, slow to speak. Yes, slow to speak. I was like, love to speak. <laughs> hey, but I was hoping that was, even if you had said love to speak, I, I, I want to use this as an example. You know, this didn't just happen. She said slow to speak. I misheard as love. Sometimes we hear words that actually aren't in the text. It's kind of powerful. So if that ever happens to you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do what my third grade grammar teacher did and say, that's not what the text says. I would pause and wonder in my mind why that word popped into that text. You know, that didn't just happen. But if that ever happens to you, it happens to me a lot. Pause and, and pay attention to what might be going on in your life. What else? Slow to speak. Thank you. Ain't that something we should all do today? If I could just put a billboard up. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. Aha. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. We need to think of a couple more things. So I'm going to dive into this passage a little bit. Hand washing. The, the, the uh, focus on cleanliness uh, and for all sorts of reasons, but uh, it, that has been a tradition for our people back before we were Christians. Yeah. So, um, interesting thing about James, the authorship of James, um, Papias tells us that James, that wrote James is, uh, you have the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, James and John, that this is that James. Um, the early church kind of picks that up and runs with it. What's interesting about James, very similar to the Johannine, and when I say Johannine, I mean the gospel of John, the letters of John. James and the letters of John tend to merge themes. They're very thematically connected, okay? Light and darkness. There's these, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
Um, oh gosh, can you not polarities, but juxtapositions. Thank you, thank you. Uh, of different imagery. Um, so James starts off here pretty early in his first chapter, planting his statements with God, the creator, the Trinitarian God. Now, to remember in the early church, the Trinity was something that was there. There just, there wasn't, you didn't talk about it as some doctrine. It was just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we know. This is what Paul taught us. This is what we know. This is what we believe. Um, and he captures a little bit of that Johannine beginning by saying, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Father of light. Think of the Gospel of John, light and darkness, right? All the imagery around light, right? With whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This goes back to something we talked about during the a joyful look at our roots, right? In God, there is no evil. There's no evil inside. There was no evil inside creation, right? The darkness or the shadows, any of that is created by the choice that we make as created beings, not just earthly human beings, but as angelic beings as well. I'm not going to rehash that whole lecture on evil. You can listen to that on YouTube. But the gist is, from the very beginning, we've had liberty. St. Augustine talks about it. Maximus the Confessor talks about it. And that liberty is very important because God is love. God always loves us. Supreme love. And creation was good. And not only that, when we were created, we were very good. God can't, God's one desire is that we love him. That we love him. Now, you can't bribe love and you can't force love through violence. Which is interesting when I go, I know I make jokes about my poor grandfather's Baptist church growing up, but he did too, so I just pulled his coat. He made fun of it too. But also there were really powerful sermons that came from there as well. But one of the things you'll hear is this kind of fear God, fear God. God doesn't, God doesn't to create us to fear him or to obey him. God creates us to love him. This is a constant theme from the earliest of the church fathers who were directly connected to the disciples, to the apostles. Now you have to remember uh, for the apostles and for somebody like James, when Jesus opened up their minds so they could understand scripture, remember this passage, opened up their minds so they could understand scripture? The early church took that to mean they understand scripture. And the scripture they understand is not this New Testament, because that didn't exist. It's the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, Torah, the prophets, the wisdom literature, all of that. And they, in the early church, read that so when they go back, when James starts something off like this, he's going back and tying it to Genesis. In the beginning was God. And if you think about it, the Trinitarian God moves in creation. The creator, the logos, the word, and the spirit moves over the waters. The Trinitarian God's there. So James grounds this in the reality that God is love and God wills us, longs for us, doesn't will us, longs for us to love him does not want for us just to obey or fear him, but to love him. Now, continuing on, in fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we could, would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is a twofold understanding of what's going on here. It goes back to Eden when everything was perfect. We were created. We were good and we were first fruits. Humans had dominion in the garden over, over, the garden itself over the created the beings we 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 garnered a, a pride of place if you will does that make sense secondly he's now the word that was there at the time of creation begotten not made as the creed says was there at the beginning came among us so now james in a way is couching it uh, in the incarnation the truth the logos that walks with us is there for us, guides us, encourages us, shows us the way. Uh, this is who we're looking at. Now, now he gets into what we should do. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Why do you think he says that? 
there's no magic answer to this, folks. Why, why, does, why do we think anger doesn't produce righteousness? Go ahead. Yeah, if you're not thinking straight, right? What else happens when we're angry? Road rage. <laughs> Road rage is real around here right now. That is true. Let me tell you, folks, if you find yourself in a rush to get somewhere, I encourage you to pull over for a second and take a deep breath. And if that's not enough, I encourage you to remember there may not be a hospital bed for you if you get in a crazy accident. So let me play that card, too. So let's just think about that for a minute. Uh, road rage is a good example of manifestation of rage. And let's talk about that for a minute. Why is road rage dangerous? For none of what I just You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about where you need to be. And everybody's in my way. And they went out my way. Why they pull me or why they cut me off. You know, how many of us in our own mind think, and that's, I'm glad you gave me this example. Just go with me for a minute. Like Augustine talks about this in terms of evil, again, going back to that lecture. How many of us in our right mind, when somebody cuts us off, think, I am now going to follow this person. I'm going to honk my horn at every light. I'm going to get up to a spot where they stop. I'm going to get out. I'm going to punch them in the face. How many of us think that's actually a good idea? <laughs> it's not. But... But how often do we read about something similar happening? Anger and rage take over, and it puts the self in front of everything else. Family, friends, God, everything. In that moment of rage, we are stuck. We're in the darkness. But yet God is right behind us. What were you going to say, Patty? Oh, I was just going to say, physiologically, when we feel anger, we immediately turns into protect this this instinct to protect, and um, we tend to protect at all costs, even if it means that we're going to get out of the car and punch this guy in the nose who's three times the size of it. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. What else? Even if you have good cause to be angry, when you're showing your anger to another person. They're usually not going to get the communication of the idea you're trying to get across. So it's more about inflicting pain or causing discomfort for the other person than it is actually coming to a more positive conclusion. Got it. Thank you. Carol, could you hear that? No. All right. Only part of it. I like that. Come right up here and shout at me. <laughs> just come stand right there and shout this way. Carol, I want you to hear this word for word. That was really good. All of this was really good. I just want to make sure she hears that. Stand closer. Go for it. <laughs> oh, um, when you're angry with someone, even if you have good cause, uh, a lot of times your, your point is not getting across the other person, and it's really more about making them feel uncomfortable um, or inflicting pain as it is to coming to a positive conclusion or solution to the issue. Perfect. Thank you. And that's something that we all have to be acutely aware of because we're seeing a lot of that today where our message is lost in our emotion. I know I'm guilty of it. I'm actually getting ready. I've been crafting this Facebook post that basically is going to say just that, that even I'm guilty in this pursuit of trying to put my facts out there. I'm be careful my facts out there that it's not really about that. And I'm, I'm like physically getting affected by what I'm trying to do. And uh, anger has that ability to really take us over in not a good way. And it can move us away, just like anything. And we're going to talk about this in the gospel. Anything can move us away from God. I want to tell a story. Uh, it kind of applies to this. I just love this story. It applies to a lot of things. So in the early church in the desert tradition, so when they're out in the desert, um, a lot of these very wise elders would end up with disciples or people who wanted to learn their ways. You know, the most, probably the most famous desert father of all time is St. Anthony. He was the one that people flocked to his little, he found an, an abandoned Roman garrison and he put himself in it for 20 years. He never came out, he never came out of his, we're not even sure how he got, well, we know how he got food. God took care of him. He fully believed. So 
There's a story about another elder where all these disciples came to, to learn. And he said, well, grab some shovels and follow me. And he takes them out to a graveyard in the desert. And he says, start digging. So they start digging. Sure enough, you know, what do they find? Bones. And he says, watch this. This elder says, watch this. He gets down and he says, oh, so-and-so, you are so great. You are so awesome and wonderful. You are so caring and kind and loving. We just, you just love the world and you love God and you took care of everybody around you and you're so blessed and we were so blessed knowing mean, the world wept bitterly when you, when you died. And he looked at the disciples and said, what happened to the bones? They said, nothing, he's dead. He said, watch this. He gets down and he says, you are just a bad word. <laughs> You're the worst person on the planet. You were, we were, the world took a deep breath when you died. We were so relieved that you were gone, you horrific person. You hated God and hated everybody around you and went on and on. And he said, he looked at the disciples and he said, what happened to the bones? He said, he's dead. And he looked at his disciples and he said, be like the dead. Be like the dead. Don't be affected by worldly passions. Start to temper those. Anger being one of the great things they talk about in the desert. And James is touching on this because it's the thing that has the most fracturous possibility. When rage and anger and all the different things on the emotional pinwheel that are labeled anger take over, we tend to break relationship. We tend to become self-centered. We tend to isolate. We tend to create. We tend to rationalize our thoughts in a way that's not good or healthy. And we tend to make it all about ourselves. They wrong me and I'm right. It's like, for example, if you think about somebody in your life right now that really made you mad, and it may be real stuff. Like, I've sat in a room with people who were abused, right? And there might be somebody in this room who is. I'm not diminishing that, right? But if you sit here and you think, what did that bitterness and that rage do to that person? Nothing. Because they don't have a darn clue. And if you really think about somebody who's wronged you that's caused you to have that kind of reaction, in your mind right now, close your eyes and try to will that situation, whatever it is in the past, to change. Try your hardest. It's not going to change. So in some ways, the elder, in some ways, what James is talking about is to uh, move us beyond these kind of passions. So James goes on to say, therefore, rid yourselves of all sadness, sordidness, and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. This implanted word um, that James is talking about is picked up in the tradition. It's known as um, the divine energy. So at creation, when God created, right? Genesis chapter one is one creation story. Genesis chapter two is another creation story. But in both, there's some kind of divine spark. In chapter one, God touches and things start happening. So like I said, the, the spirit, the logos, the, uh, the, the first person of the Trinity move. And they kind of spark some things. So there's this divine energy. And in the second creation story, God gets into the muck and makes us. And in that reality, there's this divine imprint. We, we, you might have heard this fancy word, the Imago Dei, made in the image and likeness of God. And for the early church, that is this divine energy that lives within us. That is the word implanted. So when Jesus walked the earth, in a way, that started to light up anew in all, all of creation when this perfect man son of the father walked the earth so when James is talking to people about getting connected with the word he's talking about them getting connected with their roots their reality their purpose their, their created entity their created being does that make sense like who you are in God's eyes you're not just some random thing you are a beloved child of God. That is the logos. That is the word within you. It's not the scripture within you. It's the actual fact that God is within you. Does that make sense? How many of y'all think about that on a daily basis when you're, that God is in you? Not just around you, but in you. Like that kind of makes when you do bad things feel a lot worse when you're like, oh, can't hide that one from God. Right, Brad? 
I always have to get one dig and I'll grab every day. Keeps them humble. I'm just kidding. He doesn't need a dose of humble pie. Anybody have any thoughts, thoughts, questions, comments? We'll jump over to the gospel in a minute. I'm just going to finish out James real quick. Is this boring you? If I get boring, you tell me. I don't want to be in like that professor that nobody tells they're boring in the whole class, like trying to figure out creative ways to fall asleep. <laughs> you know, and definitely speak up. I really mean this, right? There is no right or wrong answer, right or wrong comment, anything. Go ahead, Patty. Well, I noticed while you, while this was going forward in chapter, I mean, in verse 18, it says, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He, in the first uh, four words, is God. The word in the word of truth is Jesus, who is the vine, so that we would become a kind of first fruits. We are the branches and, and hopefully we bear fruit. That just stuck out to me that one shit. Say more, Patty. So for those who don't know, this is a really exciting time for Patty. I'm going to share your life with everybody. Can I do that? Yes. Okay. Patty is in um, second year, right? Time flies when you're having fun. Second year of diaconate formation. She is a, um, I think still technically a postulant for the diaconate. Um, so say more. Oh, um, well, I, I just like it when I see passages within passages that um, underscore other thoughts that we have or other beliefs that we can hold. And, and I, I, I was just happy that I noticed that one. Good. Well, um, James is now going to round out, right? So in this particular passage, he's going to round out talking about how we do. So, right, there's this, this movement in the church, and I'm going to come back to that widows and orphans at the end here. It's a really important concept. There's this real uh, understanding in the earliest days of the church. We see recorded Irenaeus, Papias, Ignatius, um, of what the church is and what we as people of God are called to do. And first and foremost, just as James did, we ground ourselves in God. But if all we do is show up in, in this particular time and place, show up at a synagogue and just go through the motions, that's not, that's not being of the faith. And we must remember contextually, uh, shortly around the time James is, is appearing and um, early church is taking off, those earliest Christians were persecuted. So you didn't know when you chose to go to church, which was normally done in the synagogue and then moved into the Roman house, you didn't know if somebody's going to come knock on your door and say, who's a Christian here or who's following that Jesus guy? Because sometimes the, the word Christian appears in Antioch, but doesn't necessarily appear everywhere else right away. And be hauled off and be gruesomely killed for, or, or tortured to get you to, uh, to move away from this faith. So it was a big deal, right? It was a big deal to be a doer of the work. Acts chapter 4 sets the stage for what James is talking about here as he talks about widows and orphans and being a doer. So we ground ourselves in God, and we don't just stop there. So I would say, and this might be really offensive, and I don't mean for it to be, I'd be willing to make the case that the early church would look at some of us and we say, all I feel I can do is pray because really what we're fighting inside is we're overwhelmed by the complexity and or we don't want to upset this group or that. We don't want to make a stand. I can say, and you don't have to say anything, I can say as a Christian pastor that we live our life in that hypocrisy, right? Because if I get out, right, like just play a picture, I'm not, and this isn't about the people I'm about to cite, but if I get out and I make too bold of a statement, even if I feel it's gospel-driven, I may fracture the church. And by the church, I mean whatever church I'm serving at the time. You know, because in Christ Church, Ponte Vedra, St. Luke's on the Lake, Christ Church Temple, Holy Trinity, Trinity and Statesboro, what's everyone? Right? So we tend to temper ourselves. And when we usually fall back into, I'm going to pray. Prayer is really important. I'm not even kidding. Prayer is so important. And for the church, that's where it all starts. Praying was like, should be done as much as you getting ready for your job. 
And actually, several folks talk about this in the early church. They talk about how much time do we put into that early morning meeting? How much time do we put into getting ourselves fit? How much time do we put ourselves into? And they say, um, and I think it's Basil, St. Basil, who says this. He says, why not treat prayer like we do, like the shopkeeper who gets up at 5.30 in the morning to open up the shop and the customer who gets up at 5.30 to be at the shop to get the best deals? Prayer should be that. So I'm not diminishing prayer at all. Prayer is really important. And that's where James starts. The doer part is moving beyond the ritual, seeing the ritual as a encouragement and a, a, um, and a connection to the body of Christ in your area, wherever that area is. And you get out and you do. So in the early church, taking care of widows and orphans was the fundamental thing they knew from the apostles in Acts 4 we have that great, this is kind of ironic given words that are thrown around in our society today, that great statement that's really just socialism or could be called communism, which is known as everybody had and was giving and giving and nobody had. Anything. There was no personal property. There was none of that. And they were caring for widows and orphans. So they understood in the earliest days of the church what it meant to care for those who were in need. And they understood Jesus' ministry to those on the margins, to those who were left out. So it's one of the things in a good way that we see in the modern church, if you look across history, one of the things that we all do is mission. We call it mission or outreach, or we come with all sorts of words for it, but it's that movement outside of our walls. But that movement has to be set in context of a community that's praying together, worshiping together, and then serves together. And that's what James is getting at. And we look for those who are disenfranchised, those who are down or out. Knowing that, thinking about the elder in the desert with the dead body, that sometimes the stands we make as a church aren't going to be liked by the world, but it doesn't matter. We hold true when we step out in love. And to those that are calling us out, we stand firm in love. The best social invention that I've seen in the last hundred years, social movement where the church was actively against the, for at a time, actively against a large majority of people who disagreed with them, is the civil rights movement. And I don't want to talk about, I don't want us to get on a tangent talking about the civil rights movement. I'm using this as an example of many Christians across the country showed up in the South and spoke out on what they believed to be a disenfranchised group of people. And it was not the popular statement of the time in that particular context of the South. And a lot of Christian pastors and Christians lost their life in the civil rights movement. That's probably one of the most classic examples of the church making a statement and living into it, but it was not popular in the context by which they were doing it. And there's other examples. I mean, there's a lot of examples around World War II. You have a lot of pacifists who, who, were, who were martyred, not literally martyred, but martyred in their own way, in our own time here, because people couldn't imagine folks saying we shouldn't go to war after such horrific things happened at Pearl Harbor. Kind of goes back to the anger, violence begets violence. We fight this in our minds all the time. Um, so James understood that. And the apostles seem to, to, as you see the early church develop, they're sitting there as they're going to the call, seems to be martyred, right? They're still caring for their, their captors. They're still caring for those who are persecuting them. They're still caring for those who are hurting them because they understood that was doing the work. To not do the word would have been to, to abuse or, or chastise or say to their captors, you're going to hell because I know it. When they know in their hearts, they don't know that. They don't know that. So James has a really, and that's why the letter, a lot of people study the letter of James because it feels really good. But if you really get belief beneath what he's saying, it's actually quite powerful what he's calling the community to think about. And consider any final thoughts before we jump over to the gospel for about 25 minutes John, with respect to the uh, martyrs in the early church i remember seeing many years ago uh, uh, an ad for some church on tv and they the you know the scene of the uh, christmas being martyred in the coliseum and the tagline was christianity didn't used to be a spectator sport yeah i've seen that so he's talking about this ad that popped up that shows um, Christians in the uh, costume being martyred and said, Christianity used to be a spectator sport. 
Yeah, I've seen that. And in reality, what's, what's quite powerful about the uh, witness of the martyrs in the early church is that all these philosophers were saw these Christians standing down there in the Colosseum, and they weren't afraid. And the only other big philosophical movement that was all about tempering the emotions of fear and fear was Stoicism. And the joke was, Stoics, you know, you put them on a ship, and then they're like, oh, I have no feelings, I have no passions, I feel nothing. The minute this boat starts to rock and they think it's going to sink, that's the first person to start screaming and shouting and hooting and hollering. And people started seeing these Christians, and they're like, I want that. So when Christian was when Christianity was legalized, and there was no more persecutions, all of a sudden, all these people were like, I want to learn about that. And it changed the whole makeup of Christianity. And that's why the church actually grew during the times of as many Thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of Christians were killed in the first 300 years, and yet we still grew in that time. Any other questions, thoughts? Let's jump into Mark. Okay. I'm not sure if you're raising your hand. Gotcha. Are you, are you ready? Oh, okay. All righty. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why... Do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you, hypocrites. As it is written, the people honor me with their lips, and in their hearts are far from me. In vain they do, in vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within that the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. First thought. Go ahead. The first thought is that God gave the law of hand washing or health and sanitation. And what it seems that the practitioners there that wanted to be seen practicing, they were doing what was said to do in the law, but they were doing it to be seen doing it rather than for uh, the purpose that the law was given. And I think that was the hypocrisy that uh, Jesus was pointing out. That's a fair take. What else? Buddy? Carol, anything? No. <laughs> You're not usually so bashful, Carol. I know. <laughs> All right, so this is an interesting take. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in this passage. So I'm going to look at my notes. I took a lot of notes on this passage, which often if I preach on a passage. Oh, go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just going to ask about one we didn't read today in the service is Deuteronomy. And uh, the line in that seems relevant to me here is don't add anything to God's law. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent what Christ Jesus is talking about here is how tradition improves on top of the actual law and, and how we have to adhere to the true law, but not necessarily to the appreciation of yeah, it's interesting. I'd be I'd love to be a fly on the wall if this ever happened. We don't necessarily know in the written record that it did, but if Jesus ever sat with the Pharisees and debated that reality, because I know the Pharisees would turn back to the scriptures and say, We didn't come up with any laws, God gave them to us. Jesus might say, That's not entirely inaccurate. However, God gave you extra laws because you couldn't seem to get it together and you kept asking for things. Um so it'd be really interesting to see the development from essentially 10 to 600 and 
I always forget the number, 42, 45, 97, 76, something like that, 600 and something laws that make up the book of Leviticus, how that, how we understand that coming to be. Um, I know in the Talmud and the rabbinic tradition, they, a majority of them put, put to kind of the onerous on humans for creating more stuff. Kind of there's the law and then there's the traditional interpretation of the law, which actually started with the judges, right? That's what their sole purpose was to do, was to interpret the law. So things like, you plant a vineyard and let's say you plant a vine on the property line and it grows into your neighbors who owns the fruit. It's a great question. So then you kind of develop this interpretive understanding of the law alongside the law, because the law would have been understood as you don't own the fruit anymore. The fruit's your neighbors. Well, then they come back and they interpret it through the judges that no, you own your fruit and your neighbor needs to help you. Like you might in niceness, give your neighbor something portion of that uh, of that fruit so it's kind of interesting when we start getting into the law you have the law of what's in scripture you have the rabbinic tradition you have the interpretation of the law in that rabbinic tradition um, but the bottom line is Paul to you I'll say this maybe this is to your point or alongside your point I think Jesus part of what he came to do was simplify it a little bit kind of get the focus back on what this is all about Oh, uh, so we have a lot of symbolism in this passage. Um, we have a lot of things that uh, jump out at us uh, as unique. Um, the Pharisees are enamored with their kind of religiosity, their ritual, their stuff that they do. As we've already touched on, they're all about being seen. Uh, and they like to overlook those people who don't seem to be quite as, as perfect as they are. Um, and the challenge, I think, for, for the church, not just now, but throughout history, has been uh, we tend to get wrapped up in our symbolic ways of representing faith outwardly, that we overlook the deeper demands of the faith to serve God by doing good, holding in check our own selfish desires, and looking out for the welfare of others. Sometimes we get so, so one might interpret it this way. This could be offensive. I'm trying to think of an example that won't see here. I am being a hypocritical Christian pastor. Oh, heck with it. Here's a good example. And I said it actually happened to me at St. Luke's. I will say that. That's a truthful statement. This hasn't happened to me at St. Luke's. I served the church where people would spend more energy on emailing me about a Eucharistic prayer change than they would about the mission work we were doing. If I switched to prayer, they'd be more obsessed with that than they would be about being the church. And I mean, not an energy, like, I'm not talking like three sentences, I don't like that you switch, I'm talking like a diatribe. <laughs> like minutes went into this email. It was like scroll down to read the whole thing. And I wouldn't get just like one of them, I'd get like 20 of them. I basically have a book by the time I got done. But if we're honest, we do that a lot. We do that, we put a lot of effort into Sunday morning church. And part of us says, well, that's the world we're in. We kind of have to. You know, we're in this kind of consumeristic world. If we don't do a good job on Sunday, who's going to find us? Then I can think of examples of churches that, in my opinion, have terrible worship on Sunday and yet are like really good churches, you know? So it's just one of those things, right? And I think it's part of what the Pharisees, the Pharisees are very obsessed with how they do things and are we doing it the right way and and they're showboating as well. I mean, they're showboating. They're definitely giving in to pride and some of the uh, very things that Jesus is going to name at the very end of this passage. Now, hypocrisy that we talk about in here, um, so I'll check my notes here. All right. Hypocrisy, uh, as I understand it, we understand the definition is refers to the disconnect between the moral values and standards that we espouse and those that we actually practice in our behavior. Right? Y'all still, did I put y'all to sleep yet? You sure? We have coffee in the back. Okay. From its Greek root, uh, hypocrisy is acting out a theatrical role. We understand the root of it. 
and pretending is the other translation of, this, of the root word for hypocrisy in Greek. So we can see then, we can deduce perhaps, uh, that hypocrisy is the negation of authentic life. Does anyone know you want to say that? Like when we're being hypocritical, we're actually not being true to ourselves. Right? That's not true life. You're pretending. We're pretending. We're putting on some facade. Um, it is a life acted out to fool others. Right? One might say we put on our, our mask. How many times have we? What did I do? I don't think I did this with this. No, we didn't do this with this vestry. No, we would never do this with this vestry. So a prior vestry might be the same church I was just describing. We had to do a vestry retreat where we had to talk about all different masks that we wear, right? And I told them I only have one mask on. It's the mask of rage. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. I had to read James a lot at that church. A lot. Like every day. Um, and actually, let me just let me zoom on a positive note. So I'm not bashing churches right and left. That church has come a long way, and it's in a great place. And it's not because of me; it's because I think they finally got out of their own way and started to realize things. Uh, the only thing I'll give myself credit for is I think I opened some doors and pointed to some stained glass windows that pointed. This was the one church that had stained glass windows that pointed outward, not inward, which was always an interesting way to think about it. Think about that, right? If you're in a cathedral, all the windows point in. It tells stories of Jesus. This church had a slew of windows, and they ironically pointed right to downtown, to where there was a lot of need. So really, it was stained glass windows and me literally physically opening the doors during church services. Um, I'll give myself credit for that. The rest was all God in them. Um, That's all I did. Open doors and pointed to windows. All right. So it is a talking about hypocrisy. It's a fool others, a role that we take on and pretend to be that is not really us. It is the denial of our authentic life in favor of the fabricated persona that we wish to be. Religious hypocrisy, in particular, in my opinion, is most destructive kind in that it uses sacred teachings about truth with a capital T itself to elevate self-deception. It makes our pretending both a distortion of truth and a substitute for it. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that sometimes we use tradition. We talk about, oh, the church has moved away from tradition. When if we're honest with ourselves, we have no idea what the tradition is. No one person sitting in a church pew or even pastor or even church historian or teacher in seminary or college. I don't care if you're the guru in history. Can you say that you understand and can embody the tradition of Christianity over the last 2,000 years? I'm sorry. Like, I'm just not going to give you that title. However, there are people who study, who teach, who read, and in pieces together, we start to piece together. So a lot of the things that have ripped Christianity apart over the last 35, 40 years has been people misguided by the capital T truth. They're focused on one thing. And they're missing the larger piece, the larger parts, because they're doing it as a lone ranger, right? Or even a small group of people come together and say, this is the tradition. Or what we often do, the hypocrisy is we create something because we're against this, and then we accept all these other things that probably aren't good either. But we're okay as long as it's not that. Like, we're going to create this church that stands for this, not that, but we're going to accept all these other things. So that's kind of what, what's going on here. So interesting thing in the time of Jesus, you had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you had the Essenes. And then you had the Zealots. Ironically, they shared some things, and they didn't share a lot. And they actually didn't like each other a lot. The Zealots didn't think everybody was zealot enough. The Essenes were off in the desert doing their thing. Like nobody ever knew what they were doing. The Sadducees and Pharisees had distinct ideological differences. And the Sadducees, in, for all res, uh, in all respects, were the minority group. The only reason they gained traction was because Herod, well, they just placated the king. And they became the kind of the sect to be. But the Pharisees were the largest by far. And that's where Christianity is born out of, as that Pharisaic approach. So this isn't just a 21st century concept, right? Like this was happening back then. People were really competing with who's right. But really in reality, as Jesus identifies in this passage, everybody's living this kind of hypocritical life instead of just owning our humanity. That's what we spend most of our life trying to do, I think, is not own our humanity. 
right? I think John, when he was here, did this really powerful sermon and it stuck with me to this day. And it was all about being right or choosing relationship and how often we want to be right. We just want to be right over choosing relationship. And that can apply to friendships, marriages, children and fan parent relationships, siblings. Just one of the most powerful sermons I think I've ever heard to date was from John. And he talked about that when he was here. How hard we work at being right and how that's really born out of fear and hypocrisy. That if we choose relationship, we choose each other, right? We choose to be together. We choose to really commit. That's when really beautiful, powerful things happen. It's like that adage that we hear all the time, right? If you want to get something out of church, what do we always say? You got to. Like one thing, the church, if the church was like H-E-B, we're toast. We're just toast. You're, I'm never going to be able to, I, as a pastor, I'm never going to be able to give you what you need. But if you commit, then together we're both going to grow. So even when I give, and this isn't just some ploy to make an announcement again, but seriously, when I, make an, when I give an invitation to join the altar guild or sing in the choir or to participate, that's me saying we've got to participate together. We put in, we get out. That's how we move outside of the self, right? That's how we, that's how we participate. Puts perspective on it. Okay. So, any questions, questions, thoughts, comments? We've got about seven minutes to go through the rest of this. Anybody? Go ahead, Mike. I just have a question about something you said in your sermon. Uh oh. You said that God is love, and God loves Hitler like he loves the world. Yeah, I did say that. So, so what, what would God expect of Christians? How would they respond? How would they react to Hitler? How do you, how do you, I feel like you need to combat something like that. How do you love and combat at the same time? Uh, you love. I mean, it's really, I think it's that simple. So the, the thing, uh, Carol, if you did you hear my sermon? Yes, I did. It was very, okay. very good. So I don't have to give you much context. <laughs> no, like how I put her on the spot there. I put you on the spot sermon. there. So Mike, uh, in my sermon, I talked about uh, God loves Hitler and Mother Teresa equally. Um, and then Mike's saying, you know, I feel like how are Christians supposed to respond to Hitler? And um, the reality is you love them, right? Because this is where it gets really, this is where it gets complicated. I'm not going to say it's not complicated because what you might hear me say is now I'm diminishing every single soldier who fought in World War II for freedom and, 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 and release for people who were in my personal opinion, I know many might agree with me, oppressed by this kind of dictator person who was exterminating people with no care in the world. And with that being said, at the same time, as Christians, you know, we, we line up and we love and we combat with love and we, we model a different way of being in the world, knowing that it could lead to death. But we have to believe, again, if we're grounded, as James says, grounded in God and fervent prayer, that things are going to move, you know, um, things are going to happen that are better. Um, I think the reality for war, the complicated side of war is it doesn't, the, the kind of the myth is war doesn't always lead to peace, right? It doesn't always lead to some outcome that is peaceful. And all of a sudden we lay down our guns, like, the, you know, it's interesting, we call it World, world War II. We already had one, now we have two, might have a third one in the future, who knows, hope not. But we're still kind of messy. Um, so I think, if, and I would just say, Mike, to you, if I were to go back to the time of the, the um, persecutions, those Christians, they would say you preach to them. You get on the streets and you talk about Jesus. Even in the face of extreme opposition and adversity, you talk about Jesus. You go up to these soldiers of Hitler and you talk to them about Jesus. As wild as that sounds, knowing that it's going to kill you, probably get shot on the spot or worse, you, you overwhelm the world with God's love. I mean, I think that's a pretty consistent message coming out of the earliest days of the church. 
when, if you think about it, at the time of the persecutions, there were a large number of Christians who could have taken up arms against Rome. Now, they might have lost, but they could have taken up arms, and they did not. But what did they do on the way to their deaths? Because death wasn't the end for them. Even though death is a very horrific thing and painful and hurtful, and they have a lot of good theology on death that we haven't even talked about and don't have time to go into. But they kept preaching. They pre- kept preaching about Jesus, which I think for any Christian post 350, so we're in 2021, that's a hard thing to internalize because we really don't know what it's like we really don't. I know I'd like to say it with you, but we really don't know what it's like to be persecuted to the degree they were in those first few hundred years. We just don't know what that's like, especially in this country, as much as we're talking about religious freedom and this, that, and the other. Let me tell you, but you got a lot of freedom. Um, we don't know what that's like. Um, and yet, in the face of lions, bears, soldiers, gladiators, spears, horrific deaths, they kept preaching the God of love. They kept trying to minister, if you will, as we might say today, minister to people. I think it's just messy, Mike. I mean, I think it's really messy. Because, of course, we're going to take up arms. Of course, we're going to have troops. Of course, we're going to defend our freedoms. Of course, we're going to go um, in our own messy way and try to create freedom in places. Um, uh, We're going to do these things. So in the Hitler and Mother Teresa case, is this where you draw the distinction, hate the sin, love the sinner? Oh, I hate that phrase. (laughs) (laughs) Only because I don't think we do a good job of loving the quote unquote sinner when we are in that boat. Uh, I feel like, and you might might differ. I'm not, I don't mean to say that about you, Mike. I I was, when people say that, oftentimes what I see them doing is um, hating the person. I think we could spend less time talking about other people's sins and start talking about our own. That's where I think. This is why I get called. This is why I get labeled in today's times. This is why I've been labeled in the 11 years I've been ordained. Literally in the same context. This has happened here, but not in a severe degree. I get called liberal, and in the next breath, I get called conservative. Because an ultra, usually ultra one or the other. And the, the thing for me is I don't care about that stuff. I don't care about those labels. What I care about is how do we, like my just cause is helping people connect to their humanity and their brokenness in a way that transforms those around them and you in the middle. Like that is what I live to do, bring you to the middle. In order to do that, I don't care about conservative, liberal, this, that, and the other. And I dare somebody to come preach to me about tradition. Like I just, that just really gets under my skin, obviously, by that statement. But I won't get angry. I won't get angry, but I'll listen and then we'll talk. So all that to be said is when we say hate the sin uh, and love the sinner, a lot of times we don't like the sinner. We don't love the sinner. We don't want to be around them when that's exactly where we should be. Think if Jesus behaved the way we do sometimes. Think about the prostitutes, the tax collectors, those sinful people would have never had the kingdom come near. Have you ever thought about that? If he behaved like we behave, have you ever thought about that? And I don't say this to make you uncomfortable or feel bad. I'm guilty of this too, right? This is our humanity, right? We have to own this. That's what I'm trying to get us to do. Own our humanity. Spend more time looking at ourselves and addressing who we are and then sharing that journey, right? Sharing that journey with those that we meet. That's that watchfulness. That's the attentiveness I was talking about in my sermon today. That's really what Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees to do, to realize, yeah, you do some things right. I think Jesus would say this to the Pharisees. You do some things really well, and that's really important. But you also are really jacked up in some ways. You probably not would use the word jacked up, but, you know, something along those lines. <laughs> you really got some things wrong. And, like, we need, to, we need to talk about that. Like, that's where you need to work. That's where you need to be. You know, it's always interesting when I think about these saints that we call saints, that we read, that we celebrate on Thursday at the Thursday morning service. We have a saint every week. They weren't superhuman people. They were messy, broken people who understood their place in the greater kingdom of God. And everything started within themselves. They weren't out there saying, you all are going to the H-E-Double hockey sticks. If you don't do this, that, and the other, it was 
I messed up, but here's how God works through my messiness. Here's what I've learned about myself. And maybe this will help you. It's really what they do. It's quite powerful. They're ordinary people who do extraordinary things because they rest in the reality of God. And what James was talking about. Were you going to say something, Mike? Well, I just going to go back to your comment about the love the uh, sinner, hate the sin. Is Wasn't that the example that Jesus gave us to do it right in the case of the prostitute that was about to be stoned? Yeah, he said, let those who are sinless cast the first right. stone. Right. So, so Jesus showed us how to do it right. So that's the goal I think we should strive for. Just because we're not really good at getting there doesn't mean that's not the, the, the goal Jesus showed us to strive for. Yeah. So I was going to say this, and this is kind of what I'll say to wrap up, and I'll talk to anybody who wants to stick around and talk. Um, Soren Kierkegaard um, is probably best remembered <laughs> for making a statement, purity of heart is to will one thing. And uh, he goes on to say that one thing is the good, is to, to will a connection to God. That's what the good is for Soren Kierkegaard. Will a connection to God. Choose God. That's the one thing we can spend our energy doing all the time, is connect ourselves to God. And the rest kind of follows. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks for being here. Don't look so sad. I didn't mean to leave us on a sad note. God loves everybody. Yay!